real-life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Now is the time to stand up and speak out. At Humanity Against Violence, we are uniting survivors, organizations, and communities to create change. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Our videos are for information purposes only and any accusations are alleged and less found guilty in a court of law. Let the show begin. Okay. So, so nice to meet you a bit more officially, Kristen. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Ah, for sure. Of course. We're stronger together if we speak out. So, right. so tell me a little bit about yourself. What is it that you have going on? So I kind of figured I would just start with a little bit about my background and my story a little bit. My background, I do have a bachelor's of science and general studies with exercise physiology, healthcare management. My focus in the past couple of years has been doing certifications and education courses when I have the time in domestic abuse and violence. I have also done education in a program for stewardess for children, which is darkness into light. I am currently doing a course with a local police department that kind of takes us inside and behind on the officer side of things like so going from you know not just the survivor and the victim part of it but seeing what they also go through and the process on all sides and every few months I do self-defense courses enroll myself in them whether it's jujitsu or through a police department which one of the cool things about some of the resources we do have in this state and in some of the local areas is some of them do offer free classes for the community and that's what i do try to stay involved in and keep myself current with to not only stay kind of abreast in what's going on in the world of domestic abuse and violence, but keep myself educated, keep myself well-rounded and keep myself kind of current with, you know, year to date, what's going on. My backstory is, you know, so besides having previously like years of management and business experience professionally, but personally, I am a mother. I have three small children. I also am a rape survivor and I am a survivor of domestic abuse and violence. And so that is a huge part of why in the past few years, I've really tried to hone in and focus on things that I can do to educate myself, to empower women, any victims, women, men, and children in the area, especially with abuse, rape, trafficking, pedophilia. I am really heavy hearted with domestic abuse and violence. It's closer to home. <laughs> right, right. Well, that is really spectacular. What got you started just from, from your own personal experience? With my story and parts of what I can talk about. So I guess a part of my healing process and to kind of work through some of my trauma. Once I finally left my, I was able to leave my abuser, like really fully leave. And I started kind of learning about what I had been going through and what I was dealing with. I really wanted to be not only become an advocate one day, but I was severely traumatized because my abuser was a police officer who had abused power. But I do not believe all police officers are bad. There are good. There is just unfortunately some that ruin it for everybody. And I also have small children who look up to those officers as like heroes. And then I'll go into this as we look into some of the statistics and some of the things that um, I've come to learn over the years. But a lot of why I like to do these classes and this involvement and kind of see what the resources are and what the community involvement is. So personally, I needed to heal some of my trauma because I had experienced horrific things with my abuser, being a police officer who abused power. I had been falsely imprisoned. I had been falsely put in psych wards, falsely arrested, all sorts of things and threatened. And I didn't have the ability to like call 911. And I also didn't have the ability or even when I went to go do police reports, you know, I got laughed at, I got thrown back in jail and I needed to work through that. And I needed to, you know, bring a positive to all that negativity. So I really kind of, 
did some research and started to look at things. And I wanted to not only be able to, you know, encourage my children that, you know, okay, not all police officers are bad. Not everybody goes through this. And I don't, I want other survivors and victims to be able to still follow the due process, even if, you know, some of the people in our systems are not following their due process. I still believe that us as victims and survivors, we need to follow the due process because we have to dot our I's and cross our T's, you know, because in the end, the truth does come out when we're like, look, we did our part, you know, you, it's time for you to do your job. So a lot of getting involved in this is wanting to become an advocate myself, wanting to kind of bridge the gap in some of those places in the community where people don't want to trust authority and don't want to look up to authority, but we still need to be able to trust authority and shine the light on that there is good somewhere and there still is good out there and that some people are still fighting to do the right thing. Because one thing that I find in the state that I live in is it seems like a lot of the middle people, the middle players are the people causing some of the issues are not following through with all of the due process. You know, we have legislators passing laws and changing things are trying to change things for the better. And we have laws in place that officers can uphold and do. So I am in Louisiana, that's the state I am in, and dealing with a lot of this stuff. In 2021, the Louisiana Coalition Against Domestic Abuse and Violence came out with an audit that they had done across the state through the local shelters, through legislation, and just through different agencies of some of the biggest problem areas that they're seeing. It turns out one of the biggest problems that we have besides funding and training across the board is training in the biggest areas is the judges in family court and the district attorneys in family court they are not required to have consistent training in domestic abuse and violence. So we have judges and district attorneys on these cases daily and making rulings in these cases daily, but they're not required to have this training or to do training in the area that they work in all the time. And so when I'm talking to people about this finding that they had with an audit, um, I like to make the uh, similarity of, you know, when you're going to a doctor and you're being treated by a doctor, are you going to want to be treated by a doctor who does not have to maintain their license? No. So do we want to see judges and DAs who are not required to have the training? Didn't, didn't the VAWA <laughs> get something passed a while back to where specific training was required? <clears throat> training is supposed to happen. But the problem, and this is where I'm talking about, like, there seems to be a problem in the middle because we have closed courts. We have people up here doing something. You have people down here doing something, but these people in the middle, there's no judicial accountability. And so you have these closed courts and you have these judges and some attorneys, in a sense, who are able to go into these courtrooms and really kind of do whatever they want. And then if your cases involve minors, they're sealed documents. So nobody knows what you're doing. So they can pass things and they can do things from what I've seen, but is it going to be upheld and is it going to be enforced? That's right. the other question. You know, and because, there's no way to know because there's no transparency at all when it comes to family courts and there's no accountability or oversight. And that's a huge problem in the state of Louisiana with a lot of the agencies, not only the family court system, but the agencies all connected throughout with DCFS, CPS, and even the local domestic abuse shelters, there's no oversight on a lot of the things going on. So you have people doing whatever they want and what it's doing is causing harm and it's adding to the problem. And so it's really gotta be looked at because people are abusing power across the board. And that's specifically like what happened in my case. When you take my case and you pick it apart, it's just abuse of power across the board. There's no real rhyme or reason what happened to my children and I should have happened except for abuse of power. And it's really sad. It's happening to so many good protective parents and innocent children. And so it's it's got to change. It's really got to change. Absolutely. And it's just, it's stories that I hear and the more research that I do and the more I learn. And, and I mean, it. It really is just, I mean, across the board, like from mm. police departments mm. to guardian at litems to judges to, I mean, it's a massive problem with every single, you know, systematic, you know, any kind of system that's put in a place that's supposed to help victims right. is hurting them and re-victimizing them all over again on a consistent daily basis.
And then when you're dealing with the courts, you know, what recourse of actions do you have? It was scary. So I'm not going to lie. Like it was really scary. I got so threatened when I was filing police reports against my abuser. I even went and did like, this is, I did a timeline. Like this is a timeline I did for the, for the police department to go back and show like how abusive my abuser had been even to the point of going back to before we were dating events that I had known about, you know, to try to be like, I'm not crazy. You know, this stuff is real. This stuff is happening. I gathered stuff. Like I had, I had pictures of of bruises, things that happened to me, different medical records. I had packets and packets of medical records. And I'm gonna show you this, just these parts, cause I know I can't get specific. Medical records to police reports. I have like, I keep certain things of like all the court documents. I had divided all of the different medical records for all the different things for me and my kids. It's really sad the things that we have to go through as survivors to try to prove Food. That we were abused because our word right. isn't good enough. And even then, the sad part is vast majority of times you could present all the evidence you want all day, every day. Those children are still going to end up with the abuser and it's going to be brushed under the rug as if it never happened. And we're criminalized for speaking up. And that's what's got to change because we could do such great things if we can just come together and train better. Look at the funding and prioritize things better. I show this just because of the fact that people are like, oh, you just gotta move on. You just gotta let it go. You know, when are you gonna move on? And I've actually talked to other survivors and even, you know, my attorney that I'm still with, and even they'll say, some survivors never get rid of their evidence because it's like, it's a part of our trauma. Like in my case, I was told, oh, you're crazy. You're making it all up. You're just a mental case. Cause that's what I was attacked in the court. He was able to make me look crazy. And I was just a mental case instead of I was actually abused by him. A lot of us though, we keep our evidence. We're never able to like, let it go. Like I I tell people, I'm like, I would love one day to be able just to throw it all away, just to get rid of it and not to ever feel like I got, I got to show people these pictures of these bruises, you know, like I got to show people these medical records where I did talk to somebody about it. I got to show people this timeline, you know, at this point, it's not like a vengeance or a bitterness thing, but this is not only my story, it's my healing, but it's my trauma and it's my connection. It's all consuming. And then when you constantly have to be on guard, you never know when they're going to drag you back to court again. And you never know when you're going to need that evidence again. So it's like, how do you even start to really walk through that healing process when it is constantly just hanging over your head. That's what I have told somebody. It feels like you're walking through the unknown constantly in a situation like this. Every day we do our best to get up and put one foot in front of the other, but it's really like such a crazy mind game, these situations, because you're like, okay, yeah, I can focus on this and I can do this and I can work here and I can plan on this this day and I can do this this day but you don't know what to expect. You don't know when this is going to happen with court. You don't know when you're going to have to go do this for this. And you don't know when this is going to happen. You don't know what bombshell might drop next. So it's like you're still living on edge and you're still walking on eggshells. So it is, it's a constant re-victimization. It's a constant just trial, I feel like all the time, you know? And so it's, it's really, really hard. I did want to point out something that I find is to go over resources I thought was very interesting as I learned. I did report my abuser for spousal rape. I went through uh, a lot of sexual abuse in my relationship, my domestic abuse and violence relationship. And of course, I was just crazy and not credible. And so there's no charges against him. All charges are dropped. But I wanted to bring something to light about the state of Louisiana. And I find this across the nation with rape period that's really something that we need to look at. In the lifetime, one in five women will experience rape, one in seven men or one in 10 men. It depends on some of the statistics that you look at the sources. But this was something very interesting that I had read it and looked over. But out of 100, and even at one point speaking with an investigator where we were talking about different things with like the child trafficking and the child pedophilia, out of 100, maybe 31% might actually report the rate, maybe 5.7 
1.2% are actually arrested. 1.1% might actually be prosecuted. And then 0.7% might be convicted and 0.6% might be incarcerated. So it just goes to show you like it's, it's very, very, very hard. There's a lot across the states from what I have learned about like backlogs with rape kit tests and different things like that. Oh, them coming up missing is a right. huge problem too. Almost half of the people raped were raped by an acquaintance. And of these half raped by an acquaintance were raped by an intimate partner. So it is something that I, you know, sometimes when I say that out loud, people kind of shudder. Like, oh my goodness, don't talk about that. Or, oh, how could somebody do that? But it's something I believe we have to be more verbal about because it happens every day and it happens all over. This is half of the people who speak out loud that they were raped were raped by an intimate partner. It's not something that we should treat as a stigma. And I still see, even to this day, people act like it's a stigma, it's a problem, or, or we don't say that, or we don't, we don't talk about that. And I'm like, no, we need to start talking about this in elementary school. We can't change what we can't acknowledge. And that's all right. there is to it. And until we can start being open and honest and straightforward about what's happening, it's never going to change. It's imperative that we get the people and the communities involved because nobody's listening to the survivors. Nobody's listening mm -hmm. to the victims. And it's really, really hard for these victims to get through this process. I mean, you have the, the trauma and the PTSD that you're dealing with. I mean, that alone is just completely numbing. And then to have to go through all of the court processes that are an absolute joke, by the way, you have to go through this court to get a protection order. And then you have to go through this court to file charges. And then you have to go through this court if you have children together for family court. Why? Oh, why do all these victims have to go through this just to get safe? I know. It's a lot. It's a lot. And that's one thing that I would love to see. I knew I needed help with my relationship. Like things were not right. Things were not going out. But when I actually started speaking to like a shelter and talking to an advocate, one thing I would like to see changed in some of the local shelters and just across the board, I guess you can say, is how we talk to victims on the front end. Because I feel like I had no clue because I had all this evidence and I had worked so hard for this or that. And I was kind of told, all right, this is good. I had had a protective order grant. At first it was supposed to be granted or was granted. And then it was just like totally just not there anymore or it was denied. But I was basically told by the legal advocates that I had worked with at first that I have everything I need. And it was very original because apparently some of them look very copy and pasted or like they say the same things over and over again, where I am located again. And in this area where we have some issues that I can talk about in a few minutes. So I was told like, oh yeah, you're going to be good. You and your children are going to be good. You have good evidence. You have a really good report for your protective order. We're going to be good. And I lost everything. My abuser got the custody of the kids. I lost everything, everything, assets, everything, custody, everything. And so one thing I would love to see, and this is a hope I have in becoming an advocate and working within these systems is training on the front end with advocates to address, even if it's scary to these victims, but letting them know like, hey, because even when victims come to me now asking for help, I'm realistic with them. I don't try to discourage them, but I'm like, okay, I want you to understand we live in this state, which is we, I live in Louisiana. We have Napoleon law. Okay. That's your big, 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 hardship in the first place. And besides that, I said, these family law courts are, are really, really hard. So I need you to understand that we are going to do our best in this way, but I need you to prepare for this in this way. So that's why I still like encouraging victims to get all of their evidence and all of their documentation, you know, because even though I feel like it didn't work for me, I don't want to discourage them. But I like that realistic talk because I feel like I was fluffed up. But then again, which I can address this in a minute, there are some issues with some of the local shelters where I reside and around where I reside. So I don't know if I was just lied to on purpose or what, but I would really like to see more advocates being very upfront with victims. Like we're going to do this and we're going to get you out and we're going to get you the help you need. But I need you to understand like, this is not going to be easy and there are risks involved and these are the risks involved and it's going to take this. I do want to see that because I feel very let down, very lied to from the beginning with some of the advocates that I had. But again, there were some problems in some of the shelters here. So I don't know if that's a part of that 
problem, which we can get into. So I'm very big. I don't know if you can notice on education and training. I am <laughs> like, I'm not so well, much on power. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's why I really like getting involved in these groups. And I love when I can find like the local departments, like the police departments that have these classes and activities for community involvement, like they're free to the community because I think it's good to show that they're the good guys are still out there trying to do a good thing. And then secondly, the community needs this information. They need this knowledge because I try to see what the schools have or different things in the school and the schools will only do so much. What are you talking about? Like, I know I had sex ed, you know, but what are my kids going to have? They barely have recess these days. We have had recess and we had legit full on sex ed because this is the stuff we need to talk about in sex ed. I know they have some courses about in high school from what I have learned is dating relationships as teenagers. But when you look at the dating statistics from the National Coalition, I think it's 75% of 12 year olds right now are dating. 12 year olds are dating right now. It's crazy. Correct. <laughs> So it's like, you know, we can't, <laughs> right? Like, like we can't wait until high school to talk about abusive relationships and consensual sex. We got to start talking about it in elementary school. If our 12 year olds, if over half of our 12 year olds are dating nationally, we can't wait until they're in high school. They're already going to be going through rape and physical abuse by that time. And they're only- that we inform our kids too. You got to prepare them. Otherwise you're yeah. literally just feeding them to the wolves. <laughs> exactly. 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 And I mean, it's, I think from the statistics, like eight states don't recognize if your child, if you're under the age of 18 and you get beat up by your intimate partner, you can't get a restraining order or protective order. They don't acknowledge it as domestic abuse or violence. Wow. We got to Everybody's got to get in the know. This is why I think things like this are so important and getting involved in things in the community because people don't know like when i share things about my story with people they're just kind of like oh my gosh this sounds like something out of a movie i'm like it does but the thing is it's real life it's real life and it happens every day and i'm lucky that me and the kids got out alive but most people do not that's another thing louisiana louisiana itself is always within the top 10 states for homicide within the top five for gun violence i believe with the females and it's intimate partner violence this is a huge problem we have Time to, talk to do about something <laughs> right right we've got to be heard and when we come to the professionals with a problem stop telling us we're crazy stop brushing us off stop you know throwing our kids to agencies who traffic them or sell them for profit, you know, stop selling us for profit, stop taking us to court for years for profit. You know, like I like to say my case, a lot of these family court attorneys, it's sad, but they're profiting off of our trauma. Years and years, we go through years of trials and years of, you know, because you get continued. I've got a stack of papers for being continued, continued, continuance, 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 continuance. Oh, yeah. You're, you may be thickening your wallet, but you're damaging me and my kids more. And at the end of the day, what really matters most? You know, you could still make a lot of money by training and educating people. There's other ways that are better and more effective. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's like, that's what we need to look at. Cause that's when I talk to, cause I've talked to a ton of attorneys, a ton of police officers. Cause I wrote like red flags to look out for in agencies. I'm like cold call in a sense is what I call it, but talk to the professionals and see where they have problems. One thing consistently, the attorneys and the police officers have said is training and, and funds, training and funds. It's like they don't have the money. And if they do have the money, it's not prioritized right. And the training, they're not prioritizing the training. There could be a whole money maker on training and educating people and doing the right thing about it. There's probably a lot of grants and such available through the federal mm -hmm. government that a lot of these individual smaller entities have no idea even exist. Yeah, yeah, there are. I know I at one time was looking through different stuff at the grants and um, different things. There's a whole bunch. And that's one of the things with the resources available is I don't think people realize, too, some of the actual resources that are available for victims. So many people, 
with with a whole bunch of different issues, you know, not just domestic abuse and violence, but all sorts of different issues. That's right? where these victim assistance entities and, and yeah. shelters, that's where they're supposed to step in right. and provide that. But unfortunately, many don't. And I found through my experience, there was one point in time I needed a protection order and mm -hmm. I called the shelter and they told me they could not even tell me what form I needed to fill mm -hmm. out to submit for a protection order. They're like, sorry, that's considered giving legal advice and we can't do that. It's like, what? Well, who, well, who can? Like, well, why? Well, well, who can? Like, I need, I need somebody to do it. Right. I know that's a problem. That's a problem. That's one thing I saw over my time. It was either, I would say these might be some red flags with shelters to look out for is, you know, if you have uh, employees coming and going, you know, if they have a high turnaround or if they have employees who are saying things like, you know, I guess you can say there were employees or advocates who would, would say things. For instance, as I spoke about once before, one of the problems is, you know, the intervention programs, having more funds for shelters. So everything is oversighted in a sense, or they have to follow the standards and inspections of DCFS, which here in Louisiana, that's the Department of Children and Family Services. But technically, Louisiana doesn't have a real entity responsible for oversight because DCFS in itself is its, its own issue. And I have had advocates, I have had other survivors and victims say Personally, they've had issues with DCFS. If you make somebody mad, I have spoken the truth. Others have spoken the truth. They've had food stamps cut off for no real reason. They qualify. They meet all the qualifications. They made somebody mad. They've lost their job. They've made statements like, you know, they've, let's say we get the grants or they're, they're using the grant money for something that should be used for. And then you get a thing at the end, like, okay, well, I'm going to tell you this, make sure nobody on the end makes you feel like you have to pay them back something. So there's the hint of, okay, are we dealing with some human and child trafficking? And so unfortunately, it has been brought out and brought to my attention that there is the problem of some trafficking within some of the local shelters. And I do think they need to be looked at. And I do think they need to be better monitored, especially with DCFS. DCFS itself needs to be monitored better because they do, they get federal money, they get state money, they get all sorts of things that people again have access to, but no real accountability. You and know, anytime there's any kind of federal funds involved, that stuff is supposed to be very strictly monitored and documented right. and paper trails galore when it comes to stuff like that. Yet here we are. <laughs> Right, right, right. And so it's like, because I'm telling you, there, I have met so many victims and survivors that have, this is an example, if Suzy Q knows, you know, Molly May, and Molly May works for DCFS, but Suzy Q is friends with your abuser's friend, and they get word that you're trying to do something against your abuser, and so they make you mad, but they're connected to or in power with your abuser, or something like that they'll totally flop your reports. They'll totally ruin stuff. I don't know what point it makes or why that does anything good for anybody. I think that's malicious and, and just vindictive, but there's gotta be payment somewhere. I guess people are paying people under the table or maybe over promising people stuff like, oh yeah, you help me do this, I'll help you do that, you know? I don't know, but I've heard some crazy stuff from other victims and survivors. And also the things that I say about what I heard from victims and survivors, I received this information outside of confidential rooms. So it's nothing that I, I got within protected spaces. This was information shared with me, whether we were hanging out by a pool or we were eating at a restaurant together or at a park together. It's free for all, you know, so I'm not going behind anybody's back. People were venting about being mad about the system. And I was like, wow, that sounds like well, they what everybody else. Around pissing a lot of people off. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. So it's like, wow, like that sounds like what, unfortunately, a lot of people are dealing with. And it's really sad, though. It's interesting here. You know, I'd be interested to speak with people in other states because I know here in southern Louisiana, one of the biggest things I have found in my time, the women who speak up about abuse and try to protect their children, if their abuser has power or money, we get criminalized and penalized.
So we get everything taken from us or we're forced to co-parent with our, you know, abuser, all sorts of stuff. But it's interesting. And I think this is connected to the child, the human trafficking that is possibly a problem here. The pedophiles. I have come across people who have been caught and had to go to court for pedophilia problems, like older men getting online and having relationships with underage people. They get slaps on the wrist. They get misdemeanors. They are not felons at all. But yeah, I have had to literally- They're not held accountable at all. They're not held accountable at all. This may be harsh for some people to hear, but I feel like going through this family court system and dealing with everything, I feel like I'm in a constant rape. I feel like I feel like I am laid across the table, strapped down, and everybody in the court system is just taking their turn at me. That's what I feel like constantly. That's what it feels like. Talk to you of everything, your dignity, your pride, everything, your, everything, your safety, your confidence, everything. I'm so glad you said the other day, you talked about your PTSD and some things you do, because I'm like, I really, I really go back and forth on a lot sometimes, even doing this talk, because I don't know who to trust or what to think sometimes about some people because of the hurt I've experienced from trusting advocates at a domestic abuse shelter that let me down and hurt me to trusting people within the court system who are like, yes, no, we're here to protect you that let me down and hurt me or different things like that. You don't know who to trust or what to trust. And so it's, it's really hard. And, and the people you loved the most who, witness your abuse or know your abuser was abusive and different things and then when you finally leave or you finally get away they look the other way like nothing happened it's, it's the hardest thing and so you don't know what to trust or who to trust or what to think anymore about the world and drive some to some really harsh realities yes yes and and that's one of the things that i've noticed and learned from meeting people and talking to people in this process i don't understand how i've met so many women like so many women i have talked to who who had abusers either in a position of power or a position with a lot of money and they lost everything. If they did not agree to like co-parent with their abuser, pretty much they lost everything. If they agree to like, you know, basically stop talking about the abuse and just agree to disagree and all right, but not really, because it's really, really hard to be around your abuser after the fact. And most, they are, I'm not trying to say anything mean about men, but I have come across these men in this area that have done horrific things, in my opinion, that are a danger to society, a danger to our children, and they're still allowed to be out there with no ramifications. Perpetrate. Oh, the way that it's going to yeah. work with that is that one, they're not going to stop. Not only are they not going to stop, they're going mm -hmm. to escalate because yeah. even the few times that these perpetrators do get busted and, and do have some sort of interaction with law enforcement, they do they get a slap on the wrist, if anything. So why would they change? Why would they stop? Right. They're, they have zero reason to. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's just like our our abusers. They don't get in trouble for what they do, you know. So it's like they don't change. They don't do the narcissist. I guess maybe the perpetrators are similar to the narcissistic personalities. I don't know. It's amazing to me. I'm like, that's where I'm like, okay, okay, judicial system. We really got to look at these things here. There's a problem. Like, why are these protective parents getting? You know, I mean, I can't tell you the money spent. Like, you are gonna easily spend, it. and that's something interesting too here. So going back to the audit and like the thing about the training with the judges and the DAs. So one thing I found that's interesting is let's say I got money, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna just go in and I'm gonna fight. You know, the judge decided to give my abuser my kids and I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna fight, okay? You will easily in a year probably spend 60 to $100,000. And then one thing that's interesting about here in South Louisiana, the family court systems, certain courts have some of the highest filing fees of any other courts. And then percentages of those filing fees go to the judge's retirement funds. Hmm. So it makes you really wonder. You know, what? Like, yeah, is, that, is that legal? Is that how it's set up? I don't know. I don't know. I'm still trying to find out. Um, I'm still trying to find out some answers to some of those things. Wow, Why? I'm super curious about that. Any of you viewers yeah. know anything about this? Leave a comment <laughs> below. Like, yeah. Curious well, minds I mean, are wondering. Is, yeah, because this is a uh, uh, this was when this was brought to my attention. Of course, I was like, now who told you that? And how'd you find out? We've got a lot of problems down here in Louisiana. We do. Another thing. This was from a survivor that. Was 
was interesting to me. That'll show you the part of, I guess you can loop that in with the corruption problem. I don't know if it's legal. It doesn't sound legal to me. Um, but again, we have closed courts here. There's no judicial accountability. And no matter what the, the Congress, the legislators do up here and the police officers and everybody does down here, these judges in these courtrooms, these private courtrooms with no accountability, they can do whatever they want. Lord, another rabbit hole for me to go diving in. <laughs> right. Right, right. Another issue that got brought to my attention that I found interesting was, so there's also racial bias. This is what this survivor called it. So this was a black couple. So the dad, the mom was actually a drug addict. The dad was the protective parent, the, you know, the protective parent trying to do the right thing, divorcing the abuser. The drug addict mom got custody, full custody of the children, and the dad had to pay child support. So then it makes you wonder, hmm, what else is going on in that trafficking world? What business was that supporting there? You know, it's like I don't know. It's just like intentionally put children where there is going to be the most chaos. It baffles me and it makes zero sense when you think about it. I mean, there's only so many possibilities that it can be. Well, to me, I mean, when you look at it, and this was interesting to me, so per year domestic abuse and violence cost 88.3 billion and per year so to say the last time i looked at the statistics human and child trafficking can make over 8.3 billion so when you look at it it's like hmm maybe the epicenter in the united states and some of these trafficking issues because these are our children right we'll do anything for our children we'll do anything in the world for our children yeah. so basically if you look at children as a product as something of value it's the most expensive thing you can have and people are going to do anything for it you know they'll go to court for years they'll spend money for years they'll do this for years yeah. so i thought that number was interesting when i saw that when i saw the correlation of this is how much domestic abuse and violence is costing and then this is how much that human trafficking and child trafficking is making in the united states it's yeah, like it, it just kind of evens out. That baffles me the most is that the government point blank feed us all the information they show <laughs> us what's happening the answers are all there in the statistics that the government does, that the government pushes out. When you look at the statistics through the adoption, I can't recall what it is off the top of my head, but you know, they oh, really- Oh yeah, that the percentage statistics. of the children that go missing or go into homes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then they have the ones directly from CPS where they'll tell you the percentage of children and the number of children that are removed from their home, what they're removed for. Well, you've got laws all over the place from constitution all, all the way down to local that clearly states you can't remove a child unless they're in imminent danger and there's physical harm that can be shown and proven beyond a reasonable doubt. CPS are required to go through any and every possible available program or help that they can offer before removing children. Yet and there it doesn't happen. Statistics show otherwise. And they're, eh, yeah. Oh, well. And it's like, yeah. And they, but they don't, doing? they don't, they don't talk about the like the bonuses that they get for every child that they remove from a home, you know, yeah. and, and that's, that's what they don't add to the statistics. And that's what they don't add. So they'll show us, oh, these numbers, they'll make us concerned. And they'll be like, oh, look at this, look at this. But then they don't show us the backhand on it. That's what being inside and being like, oh, around it, you see, you see the truth of it all. And it's just like, it's disgusting. But it's like, yeah, it's, that's why these people in DCFS, you know, that's why the local shelter around here specifically need to be DCFS needs to be shut down and rebuilt. The local shelters need to be looked at and rebuilt. These people, they have gotten away with so much for so long now. And they just think they're, you know, some of them, I think, I really think just like my abuser thought, they think they're above the law. They think they're above God and nobody is, but they have yet to be really held accountable. So they're exactly. still doing whatever they want, you know? And it's just like, oh my goodness. But yeah, when I saw those numbers, I was like, huh, that's really interesting. I was like, because you know, every time I look at something and then I go back and I look at it and I look at it, I'm like, everything leads to trafficking, trafficking, yes. trafficking. I'm like, yes. I'm like, we're all being exactly trafficked. what I found too. And it's like, <laughs> oh my Lord, have mercy on my soul. I know, I know. It's really scary. I don't want to think that way. I don't like to think that way, but it's mm, almost yeah. inevitable not to come to the conclusion that that is what's happening within this family court The system. evidence is what it is. You can't, I mean, you... Mm -hmm. 
you can have wishful thinking all day, every day. But mm -hmm. if the evidence keeps leading back to that, then, you know, I mean, same as we were saying before, can't change what you can't acknowledge. It's like so scary. So it's like sometimes you don't know. That's why I'm like, okay, you want to get involved in these programs and you want to do this, like being, that's why I don't know what to say to victims sometimes. You know, sometimes I'm on it and I'm like, all right, we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to get this and we're going to do that. And then sometimes I'm like, well, to be honest, I'm like, you're going to spend a fortune or you can just try to leave the country or you can just get in the system and get trafficked. Like, you know, what's, what's your, what's your decision? You know, like, I don't know. I have my good days and my bad days, but I really want to believe the good in people, you know, that I try to keep doing these programs and I keep applying to be an advocate and I keep getting involved in these groups that not necessarily the people in these groups harmed me, but like parts of them at one point being with my ex abuser really harmed me because I want to be a voice and I want to be a person that shines a light where there's a lot of darkness and is like, no, we can do this right. We don't have to do it this way. We can do it right. And there's a good way to do this. And there's still a profitable way to do certain things. And there's still a, a legal way to do certain things. And it's all legit because it's coming to a point where there's nothing makes sense. There's not legitimacy and things are looking really, really wonky. Thing about it is it's endangering the lives of our children. And and we are already yeah. escaping abuse, escaping abuse, which has already endangered the lives of our children. So it's like, it, it don't put us in more danger. Help us, save us. And that's what really gets me is like, you know. You would think that you wouldn't have to beg for something like that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's why I was like, mm. when some of the advocates would say stuff at first, I was like, what do you, I don't know. You know, you're kind of in a fog for a long time with some of this stuff. And then sometimes stuff just hits you like, did they mean what the, I think they meant? I don't know, it's weird. We shouldn't have to sacrifice everything we have and lose everything we have to get help. We shouldn't. We shouldn't like it's it shouldn't be that hard. I mean, we do have the the right to life, liberty, and freedom. <laughs> you know? Right, I know, I know. Like when I was reviewing some stuff last night, I was going over our our legislative page and victims' rights, and so I went over our victims' rights, and I was like, oh my god, I was like, most of my rights have been completely violated. Like, yeah. like. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have in it you know, over and over know. and over again, too. It's not like a yeah. one shot and you're done. No, like, no. I mean, it's yeah. for years, years yeah. we go through years. trauma after yeah. escaping years of trauma. Of trauma. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. And it's just it's it seems like it's never ending. Like someone the other day was asking me, they're like something about me and my kids. And I was like, well, you know, I don't know because of something with court. And they were like, when is that going to end? Shouldn't that be over with already? And I'm like, you would think it should have never happened to begin it with. It never ends. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm like, I don't think it's never ending. It's like, girl, don't say that. And I was like, no, for real. It's like so much. Oh, but I was going to say, so that just like that cost 60 to a thousand grand alone is just like the family court. If you're in a situation like mine, like so for instance, my abuser, you know, abused power. So I got locked in jail a couple of times. I had to hire an attorney and fight false charges and false arrests. So that's a whole separate set of charges and money. So you, as a protective parent, you're not only are you going to lose everything, everything's just going to be taken from you. I had a house with my abuser and it was just all taken from me. I got, I got nothing from everything we had and forcing to reside with, with your abusers where when you reside with your abuser, like I had to go reside back with my abuser pretty much where it's a 75% chance that you will die going back to an abuser like that or that's the, the that's the highest percentage 75 percent is when homicide is most likely to happen intimate partner violence we don't get good options you know it's like when when a victim comes to me for help and they're like okay my you know my friend is struggling with this and she doesn't know what to do in my head i'm like all right okay how honest am i going to be there's so little help that's available and even with the help that is available it's hit and miss whether you're even going to get that help well you have to be careful you really have to be careful like so for what i do now is i am very particular about what advice i give i strictly refer people to the coalition the state coalition and even then I'm very cautious like in my time I have made you know whether it's police officers that I trust and I'm like hey I have this victim this is going on 
or it's attorneys that I trust. Like, I feel like I can really trust, you know, that they're, they're going to guide. They've seen it all. So they're like, okay, this person's no good. This person is good. This person's no good. I feel like you have to treat this like the Underground Railroad. It's almost like you got to take a victim cover and you got to very carefully walk him or her through, you know, like, okay, we're going to be hush hush and we're going to, we're going to get you to this goal. But in the process, we're going to very carefully pick up these pieces. It's so, just crazy to think that, that this is still happening in the year 2024 in the United States of America. Like, yeah. really? Yeah, but it is. It is. I know my kids recently were just uh, learning about slavery in school. And every time they talked about it, I wanted to be like, well, it's not technically over. It's not technically over. It's not technically over. <laughs> But I have to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I'm it like, is no, it's what still alive. It is. I'm like, I'm like, it is alive and well. Slavery is alive and well. It's alive and well. For it's sure actually, it's sure. actually the biggest, the biggest, one of the biggest problems we have in the United States. <laughs> still <No>. to this day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> Like, I really hate to cut this short. I love our conversation. I'm having yeah. so much fun talking. We've we've got to bring survivors together. We got to quit with the oh men are ignored and oh well women are abused more and nobody right. gives a shit. You know, like right. life. No, we're all in this together. Risk. Yeah, right. And we right. have to stop with the nonsense yeah. and just come together as survivors and make the community open their eyes to what yeah. is going on. Yes, I, I, I agree, I agree, I agree totally. I would love to do this again. So just keep in touch and just let me know. And I would yeah, love to absolutely. jump on the next next group talk. Let me know for sure. Great, great. yeah, for sure, will okay. do. Okay, all right, all right, Thank talk to you later. Talking with me. Yes, yes, bye. Bye, have a great day. <laughs>